Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And we'll continue now our reading and discussion of the book, The History of Romanism by John Dowling. We're currently at the bottom of subsection 30, at the bottom of page 156, if you're following along. And we're talking about that period of time early in the Roman Catholic Church history where it began the use of images and idols. Forbidden by God, the Roman Catholic Church, so-called a Christian church, made mainstream, made it an absolute article in their form of religion the veneration of images and idols, and a whole industry, a global industry of the manufacture and sale and possession of man-made images and idols within the Roman Catholic Church. Do you know how much money is spent every year? I wish I knew and could tell you the the amount of money that's spent every year by Roman Catholics buying images of the Virgin Mary, statues of the Virgin Mary, to place out in the front yard in a garden, to be venerated by passers-by, by the owner itself and by anyone who passes by. An incredible global mercantile exchange of dollars for clay painted and formed into the fashion of a supposed Virgin Mary. And not only that, but all the saints that are venerated in canon law in the Roman Catholic Church. And not only do they make statues and images, but Roman Catholics all over the world kneel and bow down and pray to these images and idols, and these supposed saints, and think that somehow that merits grace from God. It's, it's, it's incredible the degradation that is now Christianity today. And I'm not going to just pick on the Catholics. Do you know the most popular place now to the most popular canvas? Let me express it that way. The most popular canvas today for the expression of artistic renderings of the Virgin Mary and saints and crosses and angels and all of that, right on the flesh of the Christian, right in the flesh of a Christian in the form of ink. Do you know, one of the most identifying characteristics of any pagan and heathen and barbarian nation is the use of tattoos. Everywhere you go, all around the world, when you find the most remote, the most primitive people on the earth, you find tattoos. Now, you wouldn't think that the educated Christian world would follow the example of the pagans and the barbarians around the world who marked their flesh as though they were cattle. But not only they do they do this but they paint on their body the very same images that they worship on their knees in the churches. You know, there's one segment of our society, and everybody will recognize, I don't have to name who they are, everybody recognizes them, decked out in black leather and chain-drive billfolds and loud motorcycles, long hair and ponytails, dirty, filthy from top to bottom, Rebels of society paint their bodies from stem to stern with images of cadavers and the grim reaper and skulls and bones and and skeletons and every wicked demon and dragon and just tr- the more outrageous the better the more criminal the better and Christians who like that same entertainment, in contrast, paint images of crosses, 
angels, pictures of Jesus, all over their bodies. They think they are somehow offsetting or protesting this vast population of rebels who venerate death. And they say that they paint images of Jesus on their bodies to make amends. Okay? To have a better impression. Let me tell you something. You strip both of them, you put both of them side to side, the rebels and the so-called Christian groups, side by side, strip them naked, back up ten feet, and see if you can tell the difference between the two. Can you tell any difference? They look identical. That's the canvas upon which now the images and idols, the forbidden images and idols of Christianity are now painted. You don't have to go to a Roman Catholic church to see this abomination. You can see it on the streets. You can see it at the bars. You can see them parading up and down the highways in every part of this country all summer long. Christian gangs practicing their imagery and idolatry, and they think it's pleasing to God. i got news for you. Or rather, Christ has news for them. All right, the last paragraph in subsection 30. This is when imagery and idolatry was a very great and grave controversy. Imagery and idolatry were forbidden in this generation, in that generation. So much so that the imagery and idolatry of the pagans of the old world were destroyed. There were no images and idols. It was forbidden. God forbid images and idols. But the Roman Catholic Church thought it might be advisable on a limited and careful basis to use images and idols to teach the heathen how to worship Jesus. To teach them biblical stories with the use of images and idols. Paintings to still tell a story to the ignorant who could not read. Okay? You want to tell a story to a uh, a little child that can't read, you use puppets, don't you? Well, if that's a matter of fact, they, instead of books, or rather the Word of God itself, which the heathen couldn't read, they used images and idols to tell the biblical story, to grab them and bring them into the Roman Catholic Church. They practiced the very same error that Christianity destroyed imagery and idolatry okay it started just by little here and a little there pretty soon they were building churches in the name of the saints of, of the Roman Catholic Church and lined on the inside were images of saints statues everywhere and now people paint all this stuff on their bodies and they call it Christianity that's how far we've come Listen to what it says here. The permission given by Pope Gregory for the use of images in churches was a dangerous precedent. He might have anticipated that if suffered at all, they would not long continue to be regarded merely as books for the ignorant, especially when soon after, uh, as soon after happened in this dark age, the most ridiculous stories began to be circulated relative to the marvelous prodigies and miraculous cures effected by the presence or rather the contact of these wondrous blocks of wood and of stone. Okay, I won't belabor the point. We all know Rome claims all kinds of miraculous works and miracles and wonders by her statues and paintings and on and on and on. Entire cults in the Roman Catholic Church are formed by 
these people who venerate certain images and idols. All right, these images became idols. The ignorant multitude reverently kissed them and bowed themselves down to them. And by the commencement of the 8th century, a system of idol worship had sprung up almost all over the nominally Christian world, scarcely less debasing than that which prevails at the present day in Italy and other Roman Catholic countries of Europe. In the year 713, Pope Constantine issued an edict in which he denounced those accursed who, quote, deny that veneration to the holy images which is appointed by the church, unquote. So, official decree by the Pope, the church appoints the veneration of images and idols, and anyone who refuses to worship and venerate images and idols, those sanctioned by the church to be venerated and worshipped and, and paid homage to, are accursed. That's how it went. And now we're off to the races. Who can be the most idolatrous? Who can have the best image and idol? Which image and idol can command the most worship? Which image and idol can produce the greatest oracles and miracles? And which idol will answer the most prayer? Okay? That's the Roman Catholic Church. And now you see cults within the Roman Catholic Church developing and whole legions of those who defend this or that, say, that saint in the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, you've got an entire army with its divisions and legions and all assembled in the Roman Catholic Church, all fighting in favor of one or another of their images and idols. And guess who they most bitterly oppose? Those who keep the commandment, those who forbid the making and bowing down and worshiping images and idols. Listen, years ago on Am Ham Radio, when I made frequent nightly discussions about these sorts of things, there were all kinds of Christians lined up to participate in my discussions. None of them were mindful of the things that I was talking about. They wanted to, well, demonstrate their own Christianity. And one of those guys sent to me an email and a link to a website where I could go and read about this eight-year-old little girl, this darling little blonde-headed, blue-eyed little Christian girl who got national fame for her artistic ability in being able to draw or paint images of angels on canvas. I went to the website to see what it was all about. And it was miraculous work. The artistic ability of that eight-year-old little girl, with the help of her mother, who was helping her sell these for tremendous sums of money, was remarkable in her ability, her artistic ability. And I was just heartsick that here even one who presumed to be a participant in my Christian discussions on amateur radio had so missed the point that he thought I would enjoy reading about this eight-year-old little girl and her artistic abilities to draw pictures of winged angels with halos and stars all around, sitting on the clouds. What does the second commandment say? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of anything that is in the heavens above or the earth beneath or the water under the earth. And so I emailed this guy back condemning what this little girl did. How 
dare I condemn such a beautiful little eight-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed artist of so great a Christian talent that could make images of angels that you would swear had life in them. And the man went on an attack against me and jammed and interfered with all my discussions from that point on. To him, I was enemy number one for not accepting and lauding and applauding and promoting this little eight-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl and her artistic ability and her greedy mother in the background. You want to attract the hatred of idolaters, simply condemn their idolatry. Call it for what it is, and you'll draw the hatred of Christianity until you will quake in your boots. They'll put the fear of God in you. Now, the greatest idol in the world throughout the Christian era has been the papacy. A man-made thing. God didn't make it. Man made it. Sinfully wicked, infinitely wicked, as we've discussed many times over here on Inquisition Update, reading the real history of the popes. Some of the most degraded human beings that ever walked the face of the earth were Popes, the leaders of the Christian world, bishop of bishop, king of kings, and lord of lords, incestuous, murderous, genocidal maniacs. And that's to put it mildly. Those who have heard and studied and listened to my reading of Vicars of Christ, the Dark Side of the Papacy by Peter DeRosa will attest. That book was written by a Jesuit priest. He's a devout Roman Catholic, and he went through pope by pope throughout history and described their crimes, their inhuman crimes, their greed, their lust, their incense, their murder, their genocides, their crusades, all of it. The greatest idol in the world the one to whom now the Protestants are bending their knee in homage and reverence. The Pope of Rome, the very Antichrist of Scripture. That's how far we've come in the last 2,000 years. The Bible plainly tells us man will continue to get worse and worse. And if it gets any worse, I don't know what would prevent Christ from coming to stop us from destroying his creation. But in 713, 713 A.D., Pope Constantine issued an edict in which he, he pronounced those accursed who, quote, deny that veneration to the holy images which is appointed by the church. You're accursed if you deny that veneration to holy images which is appointed by the Roman Catholic Church. You are accursed. And they dare to call the Roman Catholic Church and its popes Christians. And they think nothing of painting the very same images and idols that, 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 that the popes sanction and appoint by the church they paint them on their own bodies. And they think it's reverence and veneration of God and the saints. They're following Rome's example. Not Christ's. They're following Rome's example. They're following Antichrist. When they paint religious and particularly Christian images and idols on their bodies. How far we've come in such a short period of time. It says, in the year 726 commenced that famous controversy between the emperor and the pope upon the worship of images, which for more than a half a century arrayed each other, Leo and Gregory, and their successors in the empire and the popedom, 
and which was only quelled by the full establishment of this idolatrous worship by the decree of the Second Council of Nice in the year 787. Excuse me. So here we have a full-blown controversy over imagery and idolatry. The emperor, that is the civil power, the emperor of the Roman Empire, the civil power at that time, the Pope had not yet achieved temporal authority. He was still a vassal of the emperor. The emperor forbid the making and bowing down and worshiping images and idols. In other words, he took a Protestant stand. He took a biblical stand. He took a godly stand. Imagine that. The emperor had to correct the pope in Rome and the, and the patriarch of Constantinople and break down all the images and idols. But how did it end? The Second Council of Nice in 787 stopped any more resistance to the worship and bowing down to images and idols in the church. He says, The great controversy between the emperor and the pope upon the worship of images, which for more than a half a century arrayed each other, Leo and Gregory and their successors in the empire and the popedom, and which was only quelled by the full establishment of this idolatrous worship by the decree of the Second Council of Nice in 787. Quote, In the beginning of the 8th century, says Gibbon, the historian, the Greeks were awakened to an apprehension that under the mask of Christianity, okay, listen, it was the Greeks who first awakened to their idolatry, it says in the beginning of the 8th century, the Greeks were awakened by an apprehension or a knowledge or a comprehension that under the mask of Christianity, they had restored the religion of their fathers. In other words, paganism in the name of Christianity. Okay? They came to the same realization that I came to many years ago. Christianity has just recreated the ancient pagan religions and all of their idolatry and imagery, they just call it Christianity. So that makes it legal and legitimate, right? Listen again, in the beginning of the 8th century, the Greeks, not the Romans, the Greeks were awakened by an apprehension that under the mask of Christianity, under the color of Christianity, in the name of Christianity, they had restored the religion of their fathers. Now, we're not talking about Christianity. We're talking about their fathers were pagans. Okay? They heard with grief and impatience the name of idolaters. In other words, as we'll soon see, the Jews and the Saracens, the Muslims were accusing Christianity of idolatry, believe it or not. All right, under the mask of Christianity, they had restored the religion of their fathers, paganism. They heard with grief and impatience the, the name of idolaters, the incessant charge of the Jews and the Mohammedans, who derived from the law and the Quran an immortal hatred to graven images and all the relative worship, unquote. See God's hand in all of this when we get back from the break. We'll be back in just a few moments. Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. 
Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crosstheborder.org. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to help this program, please help First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. And if you'd like to email me, my email address is tom at cwaves.us. The website is inquisitionupdate.org. Now, here we have a most remarkable thing. Idolatry had swept the Christian world to the point that the Pope of Rome condemned anybody who forbid the worship and veneration of images and idols that was sanctioned by the Church, by the Roman Catholic Church. Condemned if you spoke against idolatry. So imagery and idolatry was identifiable all over the Christian world. It became a rampant disease in the Christian world. So much so that even the Christ-rejecting Jews and Mohammedans, Muslims, condemned Christianity for its idolatry, calling them idol worshippers, idolaters, condemning Christianity for its veneration of images and idols. The senseless Christ-rejecting Jews and the idolatrous Mohammedans at least knew enough about God's law to faithfully condemn imagery and idolatry in the Christian world. And miraculously, the Greek Christians, that is, centered in Constantinople, became mindful of this. Look, these Jews and these Mohammedans as erroneous as they are, at least have told us the truth about idolatry, and we ought to repent. Okay? He says, in the beginning of the 8th century, the Greeks were awakened to an apprehension. In other words, they all of a sudden woke up to reality that under the mask of Christianity, in the name of Christ, they had restored the pagan religion of their fathers. They heard with grief and impatience 
the name of idolaters. Okay? The Jews and the Mohammedans, which they thought, to, which Christianity thinks to be completely and totally apostate, hurled anathemas and condemnations to the whole Christian world for their idolatry. And they heard it with grief and impatience. Okay? They were pricked in their hearts. Grief. And they wanted to do something about it. You have to commend those Greeks, don't you? For at least being cognizant of the great error of, of Christianity. God is literally using the Jews and the Mohammedans to chastise and to correct Christianity. The Jews and the Mohammedans used the law of God and the Quran. In the Quran, it is forbidden to worship images and idols. They had an immortal hatred for graven images and all such like worship. And they attacked the Christian world for its idolatry. This led to the, 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 the constant war with the, the Mohammedans, the, the Muslims. God was using them. All right, now Leo, the emperor of the Greek, or the eastern portion of the empire, observing from his palace in Constantinople the extensive prevalence of this idolatry, resolved to put a stop to the growing superstition and make an attempt to restore Christian worship to its primitive purity. That is, no images and idols. Now, with this view, he issued an edict forbidding in future any worship to be paid to images. Now, it wasn't the patriarch of Constantinople, the religious leader, and it wasn't the Pope of Rome. This is the emperor, the civil power, did its duty. And it issued an edict forbidding the future worship of any image or idol. And he said, but he did not order them to be demolished or removed. Okay, you remember an example of this in the Bible? <laughs> the Israelites went through the same thing. And we are no different than the Israelites. God is no respecter of persons. The Gentiles are going to be taught, tried and tempted by idolatry and image worship, just like the Jews were. We're going to be found just as guilty as the Jews. And we are. Okay? That is, Christianity is just as idolatrous as were the Jews at their worst. Now, the date of this edict was 726, a year, as the historian Bauer has well remarked, quote, ever memorable in the ecclesiastical annals for the dispute to which gave occasion and the unheard of disturbances which that dispute raised, both in the church and the state. Okay? The church and the state, that's everything, right? They were all embroiled in this controversy over idolatry. It got headlines in all the newspapers. It was the talk on television. You know, play along with me, will you? It was the subjects of books being written. It was the subject of the nightly news. It was talked about all over the empire. Every member of state was embroiled in this controversy. Every member of the church was embroiled in this controversy. Now let me ask you the question. What were God's people thinking? Those who read, understand, and obey God's law. Do you think they were mindful of this controversy? You better believe they were. It was the talk of the town, in every town. It was a controversy that could lead to widespread bloodshed. Everyone who named the name of Christ was privy to this controversy of imagery and idolatry. 
And you can bet, even though they didn't maybe like the politics of this Emperor Leo, they were rooting for him to root out the imagery and idolatry in all the churches. And if he was really God's man, he would break them all down like the righteous king of Israel. And not only that, but he would take away the spiritual power of both the Roman Catholic Pope and the Patriarch of Constantinople and put Christ back on his throne. But we're going to find out even this pious Emperor Leo fell short of perfection. It says, anxious to preserve his subjects from idolatry, the emperor, with all that frankness and sincerity which marked his character, publicly avowed his conviction of the idolatrous nature of the prevailing practice and protested against the erection of images. Hitherto, no council had sanctioned the evil. No Christian council had sanctioned the practice of, of, of imagery and idolatry, and precedents of antiquity were against it. Okay, so the emperor's got everything on his side. No church council has ever yet been assembled at this period of time to sanction, officially sanction, the erection and worship of images and idols. That much he had going for him. And, he's, and furthermore, hitherto no councils had sanctioned it, and precedents of antiquity, that is history, were against it. Okay, It was still fresh in the minds that Christianity was responsible for all the pagan temples throughout the empire to be destroyed into rubble. Now he says, but the scriptures which ought to have had infinitely more weight upon the minds of men than either the councils or the precedents, had expressly and pointedly condemned it. Okay? Never mind what the councils say. Never mind what precedent says. The scriptures pointedly condemn imagery and idolatry. That's the point that should have been made from the very beginning. Yet such deep root had the error at this time taken. So pleasing was it with men to commute for the indulgence of their crimes by a routine of idolatrous ceremonies, and above all, so little ear had they to bestow on what the Word of God taught, that the subjects of Leo murmured against him as a tyrant and a persecutor. Okay, so now Leo is being assailed by all of Christianity. They're calling him a tyrant, a persecutor. Leo, who wants to break down all the images and idols to obey God's law, is now being called a tyrant and a persecutor. He wants to break down the images and idols. He wants to criticize the beautiful eight-year-old blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girl making images of forbidden angels, winged angels with halos around their heads, beautiful white wings, stars in the background as she sits playing her harp on the clouds. And the whole empire reviles him. Remember, this is not the religious leader of the world. The Pope is, or his co-pope co, co in, in Constantinople, the Patriarch of Constantinople. The religious leaders are the ones who are sanctioning the making and veneration and bowing down and worshiping images and idols. It's the emperor who has some sense of righteousness and wants to stop this abhorrent behavior. This pagan behavior. He may not have been mindful at all of the scriptures, but he knew, at least by the criticism he'd been receiving from the Jews and the Mohammedans, that imagery and idolatry is no way to worship God. 
and it might bring God's wrath down upon his empire. Very cautious Leo, very wise. And it says, in this they were encouraged by Germanus, the bishop of Constantinople. Okay? Those who were calling the emperor Leo a tyrant and a persecutor were being aided and abetted by the bishop of Constantinople who with equal zeal and ignorance asserted that images had always been used in the church and declared his determination to oppose the emperor Leo, which the more effectually to do, he wrote to Gregory II, then Bishop of Rome. The current pope at the time was Gregory II. The archbishop, the, uh, the, the patriarch of Constantinople gets together with Pope Gregory VII, you know, they're bitter enemies, great rivals between Rome and Constantinople, always wrestling for power, always wrestling for prestige and honor and worship. But in this case, when the emperor wants to destroy all the godless images and idols and obey God and his commandments, the two religious leaders of the day, the most powerful religious leaders of the day, the Bishop of Constantinople and the Popes of Rome got together to aid and abet those who would eventually threaten the life of this emperor. See how much we can trust our religious leaders? Nothing's changed. If you think it's any different today, just go around breaking images and idols. Just go around up and down the streets of your town with a rod of iron and breaking up all those images of Mary. You'll have Protestants and Catholics ready to string you up and boil you in oil. It says, In this they were encouraged by Germanus, the bishop of Constantinople, who with equal zeal and ignorance asserted that images had always been used in the church and declared his determination to oppose the emperor, which the more effectually to do, he wrote to Gregory II, the Antichrist Bishop of Rome, respecting the subject, imagery, and idolatry, who by similar reasonings warmly supported the same cause. So now you have the two great, Roman Catholic Antichrist powers united against this righteous emperor. Subsection 32 at the bottom of page 157. The first steps of the Emperor Leo in the Reformation were moderate and cautious. He assembled a great council of senators and bishops and enabled with their consent that all the images should be removed from their sanctuary and the altar to a proper height in the churches where they might be visible to the eyes and inaccessible to the superstition of the people. In other words, we're not going to break down the images and idols. That's going to start a riot. We're going to take the images and idols that surround the perimeter of the churches where people can pass by and bow down and worship them, pat them on the head, or cross themselves in front. We're going to take all those images and idols, and we're going to put them in niches built into the walls, high up in the churches. Just get them up off the floor. And stop this detestable genuflection and lighting of candles and praying to these images at, floor, at ground floor level. Let's just raise them up, get them up off the floor, and maybe that'll gradually work its way toward the, the total destruction of these images and idols eventually. Okay? Very, very cautious, very, very worthless in his attempt to stop imagery and idolatry in the churches. Just make these images and idols these idols inaccessible to the people. We can't destroy them. We can't break them all down. We can't burn them. That will start a riot, so we'll just raise it, get them up off the floor. Get them up, put up, knock holes in the walls, build a little niche, and stick their images and idols up about 10 feet, 15 feet high. So they can't touch them anymore. Okay? You want to you see the example of this edict? 
just go around the country and observe in the Roman Catholic churches. That's how Roman Catholic churches were built back in the 1800s, 1900s. Niches high up on the walls where all of the images of Mary and Jesus and the saints and crosses and angels and crucifixes and all up high in the churches still effect today in some Roman Catholic churches. He says, but it was impossible on either side to check the rapid, though adverse, impulse of veneration and abhorrence in their lofty position. The sacred images still edified their votaries and reproached the tyrant. So the emperor lived long enough to see that it really didn't have much effect. Raising these images and idols up off the floor, putting them in niches high up in the walls of the churches so that the people couldn't touch them and bow down to them, didn't have the desired effect. The votaries, the people in the churches, still worshipped them and still angered the emperor. It says he was himself provoked by resistance and invective, and his own party accused him of an imperfect discharge of his duty. In other words, you screwed up, Emperor. You didn't break down all those images and idols. You tried to play pussyfoot with idolaters, and now you're not very happy, and very well you shouldn't be. Okay, there was a Protestant voice in the country pleading with the Emperor to do the right thing. And the emperor, trying to keep peace, failed in his effort, and his critics came out of, the out of the closets, accusing him of an imperfect discharge of his duty, and urged for his imitation the example of the Jewish king who had broken without scruple the brazen serpent of the temple. Okay? You think the emperor's, the emperor's going to learn a lesson from the godly people who commanded that he do as the righteous Jewish king and break down all the images and idols and quit pussyfooting around with idolatry. It says in the year 730 he issued an edict enjoining or enforcing the removal or destruction of images. And having in vain labored to bring over Germanus, the bishop of Constantinople, to his views, he deposed him from his see and put in his place Anastasius, who took with the emperor the same attitude toward images and idols. There was in the palace of Constantinople a porch, which contained an image of the Savior on a cross. Leo sent an officer to remove it. Now watch this. Some females who were then present entreated that it might remain, but without effect. The officer mounted a ladder and with an axe struck three blows on the face of the figure when the women threw him down by pulling away the ladder and murdered him on the spot. Women pulled the ladder out from under him and killed him right there on the spot for daring to take an axe to the face of this graven image. He said, the image, however, was removed and burnt, and a plain cross set up in its place. Was anything accomplished? I'll let you decide. The women then proceeded to insult Anastasius for encouraging the profanation of holy things. An insurrection ensued, and in order to quell it, the emperor was obliged to put several persons to death. Subsection 33. Pope Gregory, as soon as he heard of the appointment of Anastasius, an avowed enemy to the worship of images, as bishop of Constantinople, immediately declared him deposed from his dignity, unless he should at once renounce his heresy and favor image. Uh, and favor images, and his predecessor German, just as his predecessor Germanus had done. Okay, the Pope's gonna say your 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 see is empty. Your your throne is empty there in Constantinople. You are not a bishop. Only I have the power to appoint bishops. 
The emperor doesn't have power to appoint a bishop, and you are no bishop until I say you are a bishop, and the only way you're going to get me to identify you as a bishop is if you change from your heresy and you begin to favor, as I do, the worship of images and idols and to help unseat this heretic Emperor Leo. You think there's anyone in the empire that's not privy to what's going on? What do you think God's people are doing at this time? They're watching the very hand of God at work. They're watching the merciful hand of God at work, identifying for them, confirming for them that they might have peace in the knowledge of knowing that God cared enough not only to send His only begotten Son, that they might be washed of their sins and redeemed and reconciled to God, but that God, in His mercy, was identifying through the, through the popular events of history His war with Antichrist. The great idol, idol of the world, the popes of Rome, and their counterparts in Constantinople, leaders of the so-called Christian world, sanctioning the making, the bowing down, and worshiping of images and idols. And do you think there was even one of God's people in the whole empire that wasn't privy to the very hand of God in all of this? Confirming them in their obedience and pointing out with his divine finger who the Antichrist is. He says, both the letter and the edict of the Pope were, however, treated with silent contempt, and the new patriarch of Constantinople continued to exercise his office, and by the rejection of his master, Leo, to employ all his zeal in rooting out the idolatry. The war continues. The merciful revelation of the truth continues for God's people. It continues to this very day. We'll be back tomorrow on Inquisition Update. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.